with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, July 29th, 2021. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Martin Sherwin, author of Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Meanwhile, in a 67 to 32 vote, the Senate has voted to take up the $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure package, passing a significant hurdle. However, at the same time, Kirsten Cinema publicly toys with not voting for the much larger reconciliation package, which is tied to this bill's passage. What a joy that she is. The U.S. economy grew by 6.5% in GDP in the period between April and June, according to the Commerce Department. And uh, it's a wait and see, though, on how this Delta variant will hamper that growth. I think it will. Meanwhile, the Olympics continue to barrel forward as Tokyo reports record COVID cases for the third straight day. President Biden has called on Congress to extend the eviction moratorium, which ends in a few days. A few weeks ago, the Supreme Court upheld the moratorium, but said Congress would have to be responsible for extending it past the July 31st deadline. In Peru, socialist Pedro Castillo was sworn in as president yesterday, marking a massive victory for leftist politics in the region. And lastly, Republican Congressman Mo Brooks, who is facing legal issues after the insurrection that he keeps downplaying, revealed to a Slate reporter that he wore body armor for that peaceful protest he spoke at on January 6th. Curious. All this and more on today's program welcome to the show ladies and gentlemen sam is out today as he is on thursdays these days but i am in i am here with matt and bradley and we've got a great show for you today uh i'm very much enjoying how i get to dive deep with historians uh on days where i'm hosting kind of solo on topics that i really am fascinated by and the proliferation of nuclear weapons, which is sometimes something that we take for granted as something that needs to exist in our society, because we've been, uh, you know, n never been a uh, alive when nuclear weapons haven't existed. Um, and we almost didn't make it this far. Right. Um, we well, actually, that's uh, yeah. Exactly. That's the subject of the interview today, and the book is how close we came to total nuclear annihilation because this is the road that we decided to go down as a uh, as a people but on that lovely note let's turn to nancy pelosi uh, yesterday nancy pelosi answered some questions on joe Biden's refusal to cancel student loan debt joe biden I said Biden. Biden. <laughs> I, I haven't heard that one but joe Biden. joe Biden. i was calling him joe bidet earlier but yeah. well i mean uh, for, for hello tushy purposes Joe Biden, uh, Joe Biden's refusal to cancel student loan debt. So she answered uh, a press pool question about it. She's contradicting her claims by her counterpart in the Senate because Chuck Schumer is ostensibly at least trying to get Biden to cancel $50,000 of student loan debt uh, in, in tandem with Elizabeth Warren. Who knows how performative that is? But honestly, Biden hasn't budged at all. And this is a political layup for him if he chooses to take the shot uh seemingly he's just trying to just sit at half court uh with the ball in his hands and that hurts people because there are 44 million americans who have over 1.6 trillion dollars of student loan debt 
Uh, but here is Nancy Pelosi providing cover for the Biden administration. We have two clips for you. Here's the first. Uh, uh, obligations, you, you may not be happy about that would be an attitude that people would have. But even take it on top of that, suppose your family was not the wrong clip. Your child just decided. Sorry, we got to go back to the, the first one. Yeah. That would be an attitude that people would have. But even take it on top of that, suppose your family was not your child just decided. Sorry, guys. Yeah, we're just working through some of the kinks here. That would be an attitude that people would have. But Yeah, no, it's okay. I think we doubled up. We tried to get two clips here. Um, just go to the link then. Yeah. That would be an attitude. No. That people would have. Okay, so um, unfortunately, I think we don't have the the first clip. Um, I mean, Bradley, maybe we could just go to the link that um, I can send. This is the first one, and we can just screen share that. Apologies, guys. has the power. People think that the President of the United States has the power for debt forgiveness. He does not. He can postpone, he can delay, but he does not have that power. That would that has to be an act of Congress. And um, uh, I, I, I don't even like to call it forgiveness because that Im implies a transgression. It's not to be forgiven. Get just freeing people from those obligations. Uh, so it, 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 the question of who gets forgiven, whether, to use the term of art that is out there, uh, is, a, is a debate. Do we use the, whatever money there is for the broadest base of support of the, those with um, more people with even less debt or fewer people with more debt? That's a policy discussion. But the difference between the president, do, president can't do it. So that's not even a discussion. They, not everybody realizes that, but the president can only postpone, delay, but not forgive. So that's just not accurate, right? College, but you're paying to so, yeah, that's just not accurate, right? So the American Prospect has done great reporting on this subject. As I mentioned, over 40 million Americans have student debt right now. It's an albatross on the neck of the economy. People keep saying, oh, we need to get young people and millennials more incentivized to buy homes as if there's any money available to them. What would give them money is if some of the student debt was canceled. Uh, or not all of it. That's what I'm in favor. But at the very least, this fifty thousand uh, dollar figure that is being proposed by Chuck Schumer and Elizabeth Warren in the Senate, and it's not true that he doesn't have the authority to do this. Biden, during the pandemic, essentially opted out of collecting student debt. Since after the Obama era, the government has been the primarily responsible for all of the student debt owed. Obama got rid of banks as the middlemen in uh, 2010, and it essentially made student loans kind of public uh, properties for the government. Um, so by that exact same legal authority, Biden can eliminate debt. And Biden was supposed to be getting together this kind of legal task force to figure out that very question that David Dayen and the American Prospect already figured out. Uh, but the reality is, is that it was a stalling tactic and Pelosi just kind of jumped the gun on giving cover for the Biden administration because they were going to say this anyway. It's completely disgusting, but she didn't stop there. She 
continued and decide to adopt a libertarian light argument to run cover again for the Biden administration. This is how you know she's lying, because if it was just about Biden didn't have the ability to do this, she wouldn't say, and also it would be unfair to these in this really dumb way she's about to say. Here. Right, exactly. That would be an attitude that people would have, but even take it on top of that, suppose your family was not your child just decided they want to, at this time, not want to go to college, but you're paying taxes to forgive somebody else's uh, uh, obligations, you, you may not be happy about that. But you know what? We want all of our kids to reach their fulfillment. Uh, to the extent uh, that they want to go to college, we do not want them to be prohibited from doing that for financial reasons. I've had high school students come in here and say with their group. So her argument there essentially is that people shouldn't be paying taxes to provide for the general welfare of people when those taxes don't directly benefit them. I think I've heard that argument a few times from right wingers, from libertarians, and I didn't realize that it was a an argument that had that held water in uh, in her mind that I if I don't want my taxes to go towards uh, drone strikes on children, if I don't want my taxes to go towards funding ICE, uh, if I want to uh, stop funding oil and gas subsidies, that I get to just like opt out. And that's something that she sees as perfectly reasonable in her po kind of politics. But like this is the road that she wants to go down. This is exactly to Matt's point. She panicked at this moment because this kind of philosophy contradicts everything that even Democrats like her are supposed to espouse. The reality is, is that she's gotten the memo down from the Biden administration that they're not going to do this. And she went a little too far in her answer there. And that this is a source of revenue for the government when that middleman was cut out and when the government became the primary holders of debt in the united states they make money from this one and two biden has always seen debt as a way to discipline people this comes from his time as a senator um and his history with credit card companies he wants student debt really to be an albatross in a way for generations of people to keep working in industries that make a ton of money to say not going into social work for example or being a public defender let's you know sh this is a way to funnel people into corporate america one and two it's a disciplinary tool as debt and three it's a revenue source for the federal government so biden does not want to touch this at all and he's making up some legal jargon and process as i return to the theme of the biden administration is hiding behind procedure and legal obstacles that don't exist in many instances to not do what's right. Well, and w obstacles that Schumer and Elizabeth Warren have said don't exist. So the fight needs to be uh, heightened between those camps. Right. And that is on them, Schumer and Elizabeth Warren right now, to have a response that's forceful and contradicts Nancy Pelosi. Part of what Pelosi's calculating here, too, is that they're not going to do that. It looks bad if there's a public fight between the Senate Majority Leader of the Democratic Party and the, uh, the, the Speaker of the House of the Democratic Party. And so this is why she's kind of, she's, she's being a barrier between these the two rowdy senators. Yeah, if, rowdy. You're, if you're in Schumer or Warren's office, it's time to look bad. It's time to start looking bad about it, this stuff. Agreed. Um, because just for self-preservation purposes like i mean constantly i feel like i have to appeal to the democratic party's desire to remain in power but this is a pretty good damn way to remain in power to cancel people's student debt people aren't going to forget that and we've done like the gradients of biden um as far as like the structural stuff i still think he's basically on a and f um a d basically like there's the it, we keep hearing these talks of like this might get done this that might get done and i'm sorry like big even big spending unless you get, get these structural things it's not it's not that and like i don't know like that, that unless you get schumer and warren on yeah. on side for student loan debt and then they get played off by procedural things that's a party problem right right you can't 
Right, exactly. I mean, I, I would give him a C because I think the child tax credit's an important thing and universal pre-K, but um, but absolutely. If these, if if the Senate majority leader is going to allow an argument, a flimsy and non and untruthful argument about procedure to get in the way of something that's that's necessary like this, okay, You're, that that is a Democratic Party problem, as you say. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, Sam has some ads. Samuel Cedar, coming to you from the past, or maybe from the future, has, uh, has a word from our sponsors. Thank you, Emma. Today's sponsors, or at least one of them, is Harry's. With Harry's, you don't have to choose between a great shave and a fair price. And now Harry's is offering listeners their starter set at harrys.com slash majority. Folks, as you know, I am not partial to shaving very often. Eh, once or twice a week for me these days. But when I do, Harry's delivers a close, comfortable shave, and they do so at a fair price. Still as low as 2 bucks per refill. Their blades are designed to stay sharp. In a recent study, guys who shave four times a week said their eighth shave was as smooth as their first. So if you're a guy like me who shaves one to two times a week, dude, you're set with one blade for the entire month. Harry's design team combined a weighted ergonomic handle with their signature blade cartridge. It's a smart, simple razor designed for delivering a close shave along all the contours of your face. They stand behind their quality of their blades so much that they have a 100% money back guarantee on harrys.com. Uh, you know uh, the things I love about Harry's, the trimmer uh, blade head for my asymmetrical nostrils, and the weighted, sort of very simple, clean handle. Check it out, folks. Harry's is great, and they're giving their best offer to Majority Report listeners. New Harry's customers get a starter set at harrys.com slash majority. You'll get a five-blade razor, a weighted ergonomic handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel blade cover, a $13 value, all for just three bucks. There's never been a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash majority to redeem your offer today. Folks, always nice to do something uh, nice for yourself, particularly these days. I, I mean, I have to say, I'm still... I, you know, the, there was the pandemic stress and now there's this sort of like almost post pandemic stress, like almost post pandemic. Well, regardless point is treat yourself nice. And what's a nice treat for yourself? Well, if you're a bra wearer, third love comfort, a little TLC third love knows the science behind top to bottom comfort without sacrificing style from perfectly fitted bras and underwear to quality sleepwear, putting your essentials, uh, putting on your essentials feels like indulging yourself every day. Look, folks, it's the small things like that. I would like to welcome to the program Martin Sherwin. He is the author of Gambling with Armageddon Nuclear Roulette for from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, welcome to the show, Martin. Thank you very much, Emma. Glad to be here. Yeah, so I, I, I I'm really excited to talk about your book um, because it really starkly lays out how close that we actually came to the use of nuclear weapons in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, and the first chapter of your book is entitled War World War III was about to begin. So let's start there. I guess tell the stories of, you know, Kennedy, uh, Khrushchev, their Castro's prep preparations. It seemed like they were kind of running around with uh, like chickens with their heads cut off, even though they're portrayed a bit more stoically in uh, more traditional historical texts. Um, but there were, literally was an order given to a Soviet captain to arm a nuclear torpedo aimed at U.S. vessels. So that's insane and scary. Talk about that. Well, uh, one of the themes of um, gambling with Armageddon is the role of luck. And I begin uh, at the 
end of the crisis on the very last day, uh, October, well, the, the day before the crisis ended, uh, Saturday, October 27th, uh, when there were four Soviet submarines uh, uh, in the blockade area. And um, uh, those submarines had been um, uh, identified by the American anti-submarine warfare forces, um, the uh, destroyers, the uh, uh, ASW planes, uh, etc. And the destroyers were dropping depth charges on uh, one of the submarines, uh, it happened to be B-59. And um, the captain of that submarine was convinced that those depth charges were meant to destroy his submarine. Uh, he figured uh, the war had begun. Uh, now, these were conventional powered submarines, so they, um, they needed their batteries charged and that sort of thing. And this submarine was running out of um, uh, electrical power. Uh, and the captain uh, uh, panicked and he said, we will not be the disgrace of the Soviet Navy. Uh, we will die, but we will take them with him, take them with us. Um, the uh, submarine had a nuclear torpedo on board, which the United States did not know that these submarines carried uh, a nuclear torpedo. And um, uh, he gave the order to load it and uh, take out the aircraft carrier that was uh, in the area. Now, that's four or 5,000 U.S. Uh, sailors on that aircraft carrier. Um, uh, at the last minute, a, an officer named uh, Arkhipov, who was of equal rank of the captain, uh, decided that given the situation as he analyzed it, the destroyers were not trying to sink the submarine. It was trying to warn the submarine that it had to come up to the surface. And uh, he managed to talk the captain out of uh, firing that nuclear torpedo. So we came close within minutes. And there were two issues involved here. One, we were very lucky that uh, Akapov was aboard that submarine. Had it been somebody who didn't have such a cool head, uh, uh, the nuclear torpedo may have been fired. So, um, uh, Despite what Kennedy and Khrushchev were doing at that point to try to end the crisis peacefully, they were both desperately trying to avoid nuclear war, but they had no control over what was going on under the sea in the Caribbean, uh, you know, uh, several miles off the coast of Cuba. So, you know, the idea of um, uh, the, the, the White House or uh, Moscow having control of crises uh, is brought into question. Uh, you know, there is one thing that the leaders want to do, and there's another thing sometimes that's going on out in the field, so to speak. Right. Well, I mean, there's such a... There's such an arrogance to believing that one could wrestle uh, human beings and just natural circumstances uh, in order to hold on to these weapons of mass destruction in ways that are, uh, I guess, controllable on uh, a level that that is is justifiable in their existence. I guess I want to back up a little bit then to um, World War II to talk about the creation of these weapons and emphasize the the death and the untold suffering that they're caused. We can talk about Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 um, when the nuclear age began. And as you write, the atomic bomb became a symbol of American supremacy. Take us to that point in history. Yes, well, you know, the uh, 
the one of, one of the important historical points that needs to be emphasized, as you did by bringing us back to Hiroshima, uh, is the fact that uh, these weapons were created during World War II, and more importantly, they were used at the end of World War II. And they were used, legitim therefore, legitimizing those weapons as weapons of war. And that's the context in which the Cold War um, begins. The United States has a monopoly on this new, incredible, incredibly dangerous force, uh, nuclear weapons. And um, uh, the Soviet Union is desperately trying to uh, catch up between 1945 and 1949. And uh, the Soviet Union does catch up in August of 49 uh, when it manages to uh, test successfully uh, a nuclear weapon. Uh, and the nuclear arms race is uh, essentially off and running. And one of the other points that I emphasize in gambling with Armageddon, and it's the reason it's called uh, subtitle from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis, is that you can't think, in my opinion, you can't think of the Cuban Missile Crisis or any of the crises that came uh, after 1945 as something that comes out of, uh, out of space suddenly. Uh, everything is connected and follows from Hiroshima and the validation of those weapons as weapons of war. History would have been very different if the United States had refused to use those weapons and uh, argued publicly that these are weapons that are beyond the pale, they're, they're uncivilized, we'd never use them if we... Um, uh, if we didn't, uh, if we weren't forced to, uh, and they shouldn't exist. And if that had been the American stance, as opposed to these are great weapons that give us an advantage, uh, history would have been sort of different and uh, 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 a lot less dangerous. In any case, we are living with the consequences of Hiroshima, and those consequences were built upon most um, uh, uh, mo vigorously by, by President Eisenhower. During the Eisenhower administration, um, uh, the president adopted the idea of massive retaliation, that nuclear weapons should be in the forefront of American foreign and military policy. And it was Eisenhower who created the world that we have lived in ever since. Um, uh, the, the nuclear world that we've lived in ever since, with nuclear weapons at the center of American foreign and military policy. Uh, and it's, as you point out, uh, extremely dangerous. You know, um, before the nuclear age, if a nation made a bad decision about war and peace, terrible things happened like World War II, uh, 50, um, uh, you know, millions, tens of millions of people dying. Uh, but in the nuclear age, you make the same mistake. You're not talking about tens of thousands or millions of people dying. You're talking about the possibility of the end of human civilization. Uh, so we're living in a different world in terms of consequences, but we are living with the same mentality of the pre-nuclear age. That combination is incredibly dangerous. Absolutely. I'm curious why you credit Eisenhower for this current world and not Truman, who, you know, made the decision to drop the bombs in the first place. Yes. Uh, well, credit, I... 
<laughs> I wouldn't use the term yeah. credit, <laughs> but uh, well, I mean, clearly uh, the decision to use nuclear weapons uh, was the trigger, so to speak, uh, that began the nuclear age. But the difference between Truman's nuclear policy and Eisenhower's nuclear policy was significant. After uh, Hiroshima uh, and in the remaining time during his uh, presidency, his reelection in uh, 1948, um, Truman always maintained very tight, tight control over nuclear weapons. And he thought of nuclear weapons as a backstop, a backup. Uh, when Eisenhower came into office, he reversed that. Nuclear weapons were not going to be a backstop. They were going to be in the forefront. They were going to be the substitute for conventional uh, American weapons because it was, and the phrase uh, uh, was developed during this time, more bang for the buck. It was the cheaper way of uh, uh, promoting American power uh, around the world. And it was that uh, presentation of nuclear weapons uh, as um, uh, the, the mainstay of American policy uh, that became the blueprint for Khrushchev's policy also. I mean, he looked at this and said, you know, uh, uh, nuclear weapons are being, we, the Soviet Union, are being threatened by John Foster Dulles, the Secretary of State, who was Eisenhower's mouthpiece, um, uh, you know, constantly. Well, we can do the same thing. Remember, after August 49, the Soviet Union had nuclear weapons. And so the kind of uh, threatening with nuclear weapons that went back and forth between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 1950s created the framework that led to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, then let's move towards the Eisenhower era, right? Uh, Eisenhower infamously began training uh, people in Guatemala, I believe, uh, with, alongside the CIA, which set the stage for the, the Bay of Pigs. Um, and I guess if you could talk about that a bit and also his uh, the larger context of his foreign policy as related to nuclear weapons. Well, Eisenhower was um, uh, a rabid anti-communist. Uh, much more emotionally committed to that than he let on in public. Uh, we know this from his diaries, uh, even as early as 1946, uh, he wrote something to the effect in his diary that um, uh, we are engaged in a fight to the death with uh, communism and, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, that was 1946. I mean, you know, the Cold War hadn't yet um, uh, begin be to uh, dominate everything in the in the way it, the way it did. Um, so uh, anyway, Eisenhower comes in, uh, reverses the role of nuclear weapons from the Truman administration, uh, uh, develops the idea of massive retaliation. Um, uh, and brinksmanship, um, and uh, engages in a whole series of uh, anti-communist um, uh, activities. And it's more than anti-communist activities. The overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran, the overthrow of uh, in, in Guatemala of Arbenz, uh, uh, CIA uh, operations. Uh, all of this was... Uh, uh, you know, promoted as uh, uh, the foundation of American, you know, foreign policy. So we have nuclear weapons sort of for, let's call it the, uh, uh, the mega issues, 
dealing with the Soviets, and we have the CIA overthrowing actually reformist governments, not communist governments, but even reformist governments was into were intolerable uh, to, to Eisenhower. And so this really leads us uh, to the Bay of Pigs. Um, when Castro uh, takes over Cuba in January 1959, uh, Eisenhower comes to believe that uh, Castro uh, is going to be a problem, that he, like our Benz and uh, uh, Mossadegh, uh, is, uh, is, is a reformer, reformers are communists, uh, we got to get rid of him. And uh, he authorizes the CIA to organize uh, a group of anti-Castro Cubans uh, to invade Cuba and get rid of Castro. Now, this happens at the end of the Eisenhower administration. Kennedy is elected. Uh, and he inherits, in effect, uh, this operation. And Kennedy had um, painted himself into a corner because uh, he had campaigned actually to the right of Richard Nixon, arguing that the Eisenhower administration, uh, where, in which Richard Nixon was the vice president, um, had done little to get rid of this communist Castro, uh, campaign rhetoric, uh, nonsense. Um, but uh, once he became president, uh, he decided there was no way that he could uh, reject the Bay of Pigs arrangements that had been made, given how he had campaigned. Uh, but he was, you know, very, um, uh, very concerned that this invasion was not going to be uh, a very good idea. And he made it very clear, very clear to the CIA that if the invaders fail in their uh, uh, in their efforts to overthrow Castro, he, the president, is not is not going to authorize uh, American military uh, troops, Navy, Marines, Air Force, et cetera, uh, to come in and support them, which is what the CIA assumed any president would have to do, no matter what he said. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the invasion takes place. Uh, it's a total failure. The CIA expects the president to reverse himself, and Kennedy does not reverse himself. And we have this failed Bay of Pigs. That provides the framework for the Cuban Missile Crisis. And it's absolutely important to understand that, because had it not been for the Bay of Pigs, there probably would have been no Cuban Missile Crisis. Why? Because Castro and Khrushchev believed that this humiliation that the United States faced, uh, this failure of the Bay of Pigs invasion, uh, was going to be rectified, so to speak, by the United States uh, by an invasion. Uh, you know, some excuse would be found uh, for the United States military forces to invade Cuba. So Khrushchev now has a problem. His new best friend is Fidel Castro. And it becomes important to the Soviet Union to protect Castro because if he fails to protect Castro, uh, the view is that, well, the Soviet Union talks a good game, but it really doesn't protect its friends. And so Khrushchev said, how can I protect Castro 90 miles from the United States when I'm 2,000 miles from the United States or something like that? Um, and he um, gets this idea. I'm going to do what Eisenhower did. Eisenhower sent intermediate uh, range nuclear weapons to Turkey and to Italy. 
in the late 1950s uh, in order uh, to um, provide the European nations, NATO, with uh, nuclear security. Oh, oh, great idea. I'm going to do the same thing in Cuba. Uh, I'm going to sneak these weapons into Cuba. And when they're ready to fire, the United States wouldn't dare invade Cuba uh, because I might fire these nuclear weapons at New York City or Washington. Uh, So um, uh, that's the framework and the connections between Hiroshima, Eisenhower, uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, Bay of Pigs, (laughs) you know, the whole thing comes together uh, in uh, October 1962 uh, when uh, a U-2 flight on October 14th uh, flies over Cuba and takes pictures that uh, on the next day indicate that uh, intermediate nuclear weapons uh, uh, were being um, set up in Cuba. Right. And I mean, then all hell breaks loose, essentially, right? Uh, I, I It amazes me the, the degree to which human error is completely left out of the equation with the discussion and promulgation of these incredibly inhuman and destructive uh, weapons and you know you write about the chaos and how close things got so well uh, one of the things that stuck out to me was how you know XCOM this advisory council that was assembled to to provide advice for Kennedy during this crisis there's as I say been like a lot of lofty revisionist history about what that provided um, but everyone was largely in the dark and part that's you know you talked about that briefly that's part of what what pushed us to the brink here. Just give, talk about that a bit. Okay, you know, there are actually two, well, there are actually many Cuban Missile Crises. Every nation that was uh, participating uh, in the United Nations at the time, you know, had its own sort of crisis of sorts. But there were two main crises. Um, there's the United States, and the Soviet Union and Cuba, which I'm putting together. Um, As I mentioned, the uh, U-2 that flew over Cuba on October 14th and took photographs of the uh, intermediate uh, range and medium range nuclear weapons that were being constructed there, um, uh, that, that initiated the Cuban Missile Crisis in the United States. The Soviet Union did not know, nor did Cuba, uh, that we had discovered those missiles. So for a week from October 16th, the morning of October 16th, uh, a Tuesday, uh, when Kennedy was informed that these uh, uh, missiles were in Cuba, uh, from that point, until October 22nd in the evening when Kennedy gave the public speech on television and radio uh, announcing the blockade of Cuba. That was the United States' phase one, I'll call it, Cuban Missile Crisis. When Kennedy and his advisors were deciding, what are we going to do? These weapons are in Cuba. We got to get rid of them, they decided. Why? Are they dangerous? No. Um, Are they going to change the balance of power? No. McNamara says uh, it's not an issue of of security. It's a a political issue. Uh, After the Bay of Pigs, if Kennedy allowed, this was their judgment, if Kennedy allowed the missiles to stay in Cuba, his chance for re-election was probably less than zero. Um, so it's this political issue. Now, how do we get rid of the weapons? Uh, most of the advisors are arguing, and all of the Joint Chiefs are arguing that we need to bomb and invade. Kennedy goes along with that on the first day. 
uh, he happens, and this is another element of luck, uh, to have a prearranged luncheon with Adlai Stevenson, the American ambassador to the United Nations, uh, who, when he is told by Kennedy about the uh, uh, discovery of these weapons, uh, says to the president, no, bombing and invasion is a very bad idea. And this can be solved diplomatically. And we know exactly, more or less exactly what he told the president on October 16th uh, after lunch, because the next day he writes a memorandum summarizing their conversation. Um, so over the next, one of the fascinating things that uh, at least what I find fascinating uh, in, in studying this and writing it up was the watching Kennedy slowly change his mind about invasion and bombing. Uh, it's fascinating to see this president's mind at work uh, and we can talk about seeing his mind at work because we have a unique source about, well, several months before, the president had a secret recording system placed in the cabinet room and the Oval Office. And during all of these meetings with his advisors, he switched on the tape recording system. So we know exactly what the president said, what McNamara said, what Rusk said, uh, and so on and so forth. There were about 14 advisors. Um, and we watched the president, uh, and, and this is the way I organized uh, the uh, section on the Cuban Missile Crisis, focusing on how the president thought about the issues. And one of the in most interesting things about uh, his analysis was his constant questioning. And he was the only one who did this, his constant questioning. Why did Khrushchev do this? What does he have in mind? And uh, it's interesting to see how Kennedy's mind works so differently from McNamara and Rusk and, you know, and the others. Well, I have to ask about that, you know, I know uh, probably lastly, I, McNamara, military officials around him, the fact that he was thinking so differently from them probably saved us from a lot of bloodshed, right? Uh, yeah. which <laughs> it probably saved the world from a nuclear war. Exactly. Well, I was downplaying it, but I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious about how often you came across military advisors and just people in the military calling for preemptive strikes during this time um, because there were a lot of probably close calls, even more than the ones that you documented in this book. Uh, yes. All right. One of the most interesting things to consider is um, uh, where people came from, so to speak. Uh, what were their experiences? What shapes their view of the world? And the contrast between Kennedy, um, uh, second lieutenant, naval officer during World War II, and General LeMay and General Wheeler and General Shoup, Shoup and General Taylor, uh, all of the joint chiefs who were senior officers during World War II. Uh, you know, that, that provides one of the elements for analysis of why people thought the way they did. The Joint Chiefs unanimously wanted to, and consistently, wanted to invade and bomb Cuba. And when Kennedy asked General LeMay, for example, the uh, uh, Air Force Chief of Staff, well, what are the Soviets going to do when we, uh, you know, we kill a lot of their troops and we, you know, bomb by bombing Cuba and all of that? Um, uh, LeMay says, they're not going to do anything. And Kennedy says, oh, really? You know, uh, why? Well, he said, 
because you know they know we're going to wipe them out if they um, uh, if they do something. And Kennedy has a totally different view. On October 19th, Friday before his speech, he meets with the Joint Chiefs. And uh, he says, you know, let me explain my point of view. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if we invade Cuba, uh, this will give Khrushchev the opportunity or the excuse uh, to invade uh, West Berlin and kick us and try to kick us out of there. If they do that, I'm going to have to use nuclear weapons. Uh, if I use nuclear weapons, the Soviets are going to respond with nuclear weapons. We're going to have a nuclear war. Uh, that doesn't make much sense. Um, and there are these two different views. Kennedy is thinking globally and thinking about the uh, relationship with our NATO allies and how important that is and how that obligates us in ways that um, could lead to a, a disaster if we make the wrong decision. And the Joint Chiefs are just saying, look, uh, this is a good excuse to get rid of Castro. Uh, let, let's invade. The Soviets aren't going to do anything. They wouldn't dare. Well, what kind of guarantees do we have of that? You know, it's uh, all policy decisions. In fact, all our decisions in life are based on assumptions. And those assumptions are the product usually of our experience and how we see the world. And uh, again, one of the most fascinating things about this story is the difference between how Kennedy sees the world and how the Joint Chiefs see the world and how Kennedy's advisors uh, see the world. And fortunately, uh, in the end, both Kennedy and Khrushchev saw the world in the same way. That is to say, <laughs> they wanted to do everything to keep the world in one piece <laughs> and not blow it up. Uh, and finally, on Sunday, October 28th, uh, Khrushchev, who is uh, panicked about losing control over all uh, over his troops in Cuba, uh, they, for example, on Saturday, the day before, uh, uh, while the submarine story was going on, unknown to them, uh, the uh, a so a Soviet aircraft uh, surface -to air uh, crew shot down a U-2. Khrushchev hadn't authorized that. Um, so by Sunday, he was quite panicked. And um, uh, it, it, it's too complicated a story to tell at this point, but basically said, basta. Uh, uh, oh, we're, 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 we're going to settle this thing. I mean, the amount of close calls are, it's, it's incredible. We're very lucky. Uh, I appreciate your time. Martin Sherwin, he's the author of Gambling with Armageddon, Nuclear Roulette from Hiroshima to the Cuban Missile Crisis. And you, you have a variety of books on this topic. I'd encourage uh, people to check them out. Thank you so much, Martin, for your time today. Uh, thank you, Emma, for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a quick break and be right back. Break news.
That was such a great history lesson. Um, I, I don't know how you felt, Matt, but... Uh, yeah, I think, you know, um, a lot of people know that Kennedy was a cold uh, war hawk, particularly in the 1960 election to beat Nixon. But when you actually uh, look at his record in and what his advisors wanted him to do, for instance, at the Bay of Pigs or during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, I think his legacy looks a little bit better. I mean, obviously, I have plenty of time to talk about all the things he did participate in, like continuing um, um, covert uh, assassination attempts against like people like Castro and stuff like that. But you have to understand who else was in the room right. at that point. Right, right, um, That's That was the most illuminating part of that for me. Um, but before we go, let's talk a little bit about the CDC. So <clears throat> Anthony Fauci was on MSNBC the other day addressing the fact that some weeks ago, the CDC said, do away with your masks. At the time, I thought that was silly. And so did the National Nurses Unions. Yep. And now he's having to explain why it wasn't silly. Let's hear what he had to say. Something has changed, and what has changed is the virus. The CDC hasn't changed, and the CDC hasn't really flip-flopped at all. What's happened is that when that earlier recommendation was made, we were dealing predominantly with the alpha variant. Exactly. But that's the exact point. We knew that variants were coming. What the CDC was thinking was, and I, I don't agree with this thinking, but I'm going to say it to people because a lot of people who cover, you know, say an error that Fauci or the CDC make don't point out that they're overwhelmingly right and their guidance should be followed on almost everything because this is a pandemic and they're coming out with these public health measures on purpose. But there are points where, of course, they're not above criticism. Um, they knew the Delta variant was coming, not in it, uh, in itself, but they knew that variants were coming, that it was going to become more transmissible. And that was the whole purpose behind the, the vaccine push, because we wanted to outpace the creation of the variants with the vaccine push um and so i i don't even think this is helpful right we could say you know oh at that time uh we might we made an error essentially right but to say oh we don't flip-flop that's not necessarily true um well i mean to say the virus changed like the virus didn't start like having the ability to mutate, as he mentioned, they were already dealing with uh, a variation of it already. And so we knew that this was a possibility. And that's why people like the nurses unions were like, hey, let's not do this just be, just for like basically the um, the nudge that it might give people who are skeptical of vaccines. Right. Like which I it think, didn't do. It didn't right. Do, yeah. it, and, and we could we foresaw that this would be the case. They made a political calculation about this. They chose that they were going to use masks as a bit of a, a carrot to get people to get more vaccinated. And that's not what we saw. That's not what we saw at all. Um, and now the, the it's impossible to put the toothpaste back into the tube in many ways because people are already not wearing masks. And red states were going to run with this no matter what. I think it's time for a new person to be making these sorts of statements than uh, Fauci. I think Fauci should step down. I agree. Fauci can, if he wants to have his role in the CDC um, in a different capacity, cool. Like, I mean, he certainly has the credentials. But in terms of a public face, they're literally selling don't Fauci my Florida shirts in Florida on DeSantis's website and it's always it's always a political motivation I don't know how much time we have left but just quickly about the mask thing at the start of the pandemic right that was Fauci trying to preserve stock and not actually like uh, and we muddled mask signs from the beginning there. yeah and so the point is is that he's been politicized in many ways against his will but then the CDC has also made political calculations and he's become a political figure so we appreciate a lot of his work maybe time for a new face but that's all the time we have today. And thank you so much for tuning in, Peacock audience. We will see you with Sam for Casual Friday tomorrow. And uh, actually, we might need to go look at Sam uh, right now because uh, I accidentally put up the wrong ad. I had them labeled wrong. So we need to play a better help ad. Just oh, for a brief... okay. Well, hello, Sam. Uh, 
Good to see you. Yep, here goes Sam. God. Thank you, Emma. Uh, it's messed up. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah, it, there's something wrong. Oh, gosh. With the ad? Yeah, because... Oh, um, man, I don't even know how to fix it. This is going to look a little bit weird for a, fo for a little bit, folks, but give me a second. Boop, 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 boop. Thank you, we're Emma. We're just, you know, we're having... We're having a... Hey, today's oh. sponsor is BetterHelp Online Counseling. They're giving our audience 10% off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. Now, uh, I'm sure you're aware if you've attempted to go see a therapist, therapists elsewhere have long wait lists. Sometimes it can take you weeks. Sometimes it can take you months before they can see you. But when you sign up with BetterHelp, they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs, and you'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. A lot of people um, found telemedicine to be very helpful, uh, particularly uh, therapy during COVID. And I suspect there's a lot of folks who are just going to stick with that. I found it much more convenient. Uh, obviously, a lot of stress coming out of a pandemic, a lot of stress during a pandemic, a lot of stress when there's not a pandemic. Therapy has been extremely helpful for me. It's always helpful to speak to someone. Uh, and once BetterHelp connects you with a therapist, if you find that it's not a good fit, you can switch to a new one at any time for any reason with no additional charge. They have thousands of licensed therapists from all over the country. So they have therapists with specialties that may not even be available in your area. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists that you'd find through traditional means. You don't have to have insurance to use BetterHelp, and they have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp is giving everyone in our audience 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash majority report. You can find the URL in the description of this uh, video or podcast and um, check it out. We're back. We are back. Thank you so much, Sam, for those that beautiful advertisement. Matt, <laughs> how are you doing, man? I'm doing good, Emma. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. And I also have correct grammar. Uh, what's happening over on Doomed? Well, on Doomed, there's going to be a live show tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And stay tuned to what's happening tonight. You know, things plan sometimes change, as you know, but it'll be a great show for you all tonight. YouTube.com slash Matt Binder at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and I'll see you all then. Nice. And now we're joined by Brandon Sutton. What's up, Brandon? Hey, guys. Uh, you know, I am a little bit late. I was just watching the majority report with Sam Cedar. I don't know if you've heard of it. Oh. And I got distracted. Oh, gotcha. Uh, but for me, actually, we haven't recorded this week. I'm sorry. Life got in the way. Uh, I was helping a friend move. Um, so uh, I'll keep you updated via Twitter. Very nice. Uh, the uh, the MR Thursday crew uh, uh, shows are, are really well planned, as you can see. We all have our our stuff together and <laughs> i i have never said i have my stuff together I, i'm i'm an amateur well wow. luckily left reckoning is on wednesdays now so wow. we got our stuff together last night um we had ben spielberg on to talk about health care and joe biden's broken promises and how to deal with that and also pressure the squad without uh, labeling them fraud squad and uh, how that's actually an easier thing to do um but um with all the acrimony i think and uh, heretic hunting on all sides, um, it's been a little bit difficult to figure out um, how to say no um, to a lot of this stuff. But uh, so check that out, Ben Spielberg last night. We also, I also got into uh, Chris Rufo, uh, the CRT um, panic stoker, and his uh, laundry boy, uh, Connor Friedersdorf, who works for The Atlantic. Um, so check that out. Uh, we got into CRT in depth is like a sort of, I mean, basically it's a red panic. Um, I mean, these guys call it Marxist all the time. It's not Marxist, but you know, what it does do is 
is uh, in <laughs> informing people as to why certain hierarchies might not be natural and might be, you know, a result of policy. So anyway, last night, Left Reckoning, patreon.com slash Left Reckoning, to the post game where I talk about um, a 10-year-old article I wrote when I had just read uh, Marx for the first time. And um, it starts, you can see that it influenced me. So check Aww. that out. Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning, which actually that I, I'm going on a lot, but um, pay, our post game video got taken down because we were discussing Will Witt's um, uh, uh, pandemic conspiracy. And I don't want to say anything more than that because um, you get strikes for doing things like that. Um, but Will Witt, a Prager you guy, had a bad theory about uh, uh, capitalism in China um, and this virus, and we got that taken down. So if you want to hear it, patreon.com slash Left Reckoning. All right, that sounds good. We will head into the fun half now, 646-257-3920. See you there. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, no. What, who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy, is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. And the alpha males are back, 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 boy, is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just want to degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. Bring back nightmare. 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 Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little party you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total, total, Real taste to me for whatever reason. We're back. Uh, yeah, you guys might have heard the tail end of. Uh, I hope so. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> like if, that, if that was all that it, if that was all that they heard, it'd be hilarious. Matt says he's hungry, and I said, "Do you want some cashews?" Matt doesn't like nuts, and Brandon is very allergic. So. I'm very allergic to nuts, and so like if you caught the tail end, all you would have heard is, uh, "Nuts have no taste to me." So like, it'd be hilarious. Well, I mean, now we went through the whole thing again, so it's a little bit less funny. But 
really hope it cut off, cut it off right before that exact phrase. It might be funny. People might be able to go back. And well, I mean, if not, people can just clip it where I said it again and just pretend as though it was that first time. So people I, should do that. That's why I said it again. So you, everyone could just in case. I, I mean, I appreciate you giving the people what they want. People want it. Right. <laughs> uh, let me read some IMs because we got some probably about the interview. Um or at least about the Pelosi thing that we talked about earlier. This Pelosi thing is just blowing my mind, says Illuminati kids. How does that statement not get thrown back in the Dems' face to undermine any spending proposal? It's when like you if- talk about oh the uh, when she said about student loans. Yes, it's like if Sam admitted he thinks taxation is theft, but then still tried to debate libertarian call or somehow. That's <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Um, Appin, Appinva says, listen, y'all, college is supposed to be about laundering privilege. If you want to learn some stuff, you're going to have to live in debt, for sure. Uh, that is, I mean, that is what this is. It's a social mobility tax, and it needs to get heavier and heavier, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, Shane from Canada says, I could be wrong, but with places like the CDC and Health Canada up here, we are seeing what institutions with cut funding look like, and it is a poor response. I'm not sure about the C. I mean, the pandemic response unit was cut in the United States by Trump before this happened. Um, but like in terms of just their mixed messaging on masks, I think that's like a political decision with a lot of people in the room who are trying to say something that that, you know, they make a decision on collectively. Yeah, I think the CDC people are trying to do the best job they can in a system that is too awash with cash and monetary influence and, you know, economic necessity for capitalism. Right. Want to take a call, Bender? Yeah, let's grab a call. I will say about the CDC thing, though, I mean, like, you know, the, the messaging. And so whoever's involved with their, with their messaging should... Uh, they need someone new there, I think. Not to say anyone should lose their job, but perhaps add an additional person who's a little bit better at it. <laughs> you know, I think uh, Emma was right. And the CDC and the FDA are kind, of, are kind of in that same bucket. They've both been victims of like heavy cuts and heavy privatization as a result of all of these, you know, uh, neoliberal presidencies. And now that makes them even weaker to scrutiny by the public because like, yeah, they do make a lot of bad decisions. There are like a lot of costs wasting measures that have been implemented but you know they're not because they're a government industry they're i mean or an agency they're because they were put in by uh privatization uh advocates right right, right. but you know, i think the people who are there do have uh, a responsibility to push back and obviously there's a lot of politics in there and who knows what goes on behind the scenes but you know, a lot of, uh, not a lot, I'm not going to say a lot because I don't want to put a number on it, but there are certain things out there that anti-vaxxers, anti-maskers, all these people have latched onto that did originally, uh, or they, they, I mean, they, they'll always find something, but they hold on to something that the CDC said that was inaccurate or wrong uh, that we know from, you know, later on finding out that the CDC did this for a messaging thing and they knew like with masks, for example, just awful on that in the beginning um, when it would it's come out that they said not to wear them because they were worried about there being a shortage, which they should have just said that. <laughs> um, so I, I do think there are some issues there, but I, I also agree with you guys. Right. Um, Let's go to the phones. I would just say really quickly, like oh. I think we should have a culture of, uh, res- resignation like when you fail you should resign in other political parties across the like world if they f- f- lose an election for instance there's a uh, there's a uh, uh um a shuffling of leadership at the very least and we have the same like vampires that have been there since i've been like um like learning to ride a bike all right let's go to two five three what's your name where are you calling from is this me this is you Oh, wow. Uh, hi, I'm Chris from Seattle. Hi, Chris from and, Seattle. Uh, oh, wow. Uh, so the reason I wanted to call, I'm a big fan of the show. I listen to you guys a lot. listen to a lot of the other uh, political shows, Ben Burgess and even like Bosch and stuff. And um, I want to take a second and ask, I'm from Chicago originally. Are you guys familiar with the crash test, the crash test dummy commercials from like the eighties? I am. All right. So this is going to seem weird, but for those of you who don't know, 
in the 80s, like 80% of Americans did not want to wear seatbelts. They thought that seatbelts were, were uh, stupid and uh, they thought that something was wrong with the car if you wore, if you had to wear a seatbelt. And we were showing commercials where people were getting in terrible accidents and trying to educate people and they would not change their mind. You could not with actual information get people to recognize the intelligence of a seatbelt. Um, and it took the crash test dummies, uh, which was basically just a comedy commercial to drastically change the minds of, uh, of Americans and make uh, seatbelts traditional. And now we all just know that if you don't wear a seatbelt, you're stupid. And so maybe you guys can see where I'm going with this. I, I think that what the left has, we have so many smart people who are making really intelligent arguments uh, and we're not changing anybody's mind. I think it's really time that we start focusing and I don't, I'm not saying like, stop what you're doing, but I just want to try and make this as like a call out to leftists. We have got to start doing an advertising of what our life and the sort of world that we want. We actually need to advertise what it looks like because these people on the right there, I mean, they're just, they, if, they're shown, they're shown videos of people crashing through windshields and they still won't wear a seatbelt. They see their family members dying of COVID and they still won't wear a mask. We need to get creative. Uh, and um, we, we need to start figuring out ways to sort of advertise our lifestyle and our philosophies to these people in a way that is quick, funny, and consumable. And I just wanted to think, kind of get what you guys had uh, thoughts on that. Have- I, oh, go ahead, Emma. You have a good point. I mean, like, are you kind of saying some funny version of anti-smoking ads with like the lady <laughs> who? Well, you know? I, well, I guess I, I mean, I guess what I'm saying is like, I, I don't know if you guys know, like Edward Bernays, who was an ad, a very uh, successful ad agent or something um, in the '60s or '70s, and he basically created the idea of the American mythos, the white picket fence, the fucking, um, sorry, um, uh, the the cars, you know, the two car driveway, the three family household, or whatever. He basically created that through ads. Um, and so what I'm saying is, we need to sort of carpet bomb. I, mean, I don't know if it's memes. I don't know if we need to have uh, uh, commercials. I don't. I, I just think that there's. I think we've hit the ceiling in terms of like intelligent debate conversations actually making a difference. But the right has shown that they understand the effectiveness of advertising, the effectiveness of sort of mythologizing and creating a picture like. I'm a I'm a, a, a democratic socialist, and even I can't really visualize uh, in the what America looks like when, if we were to win. If we were to straight up win, and our policies would go through. I I think that the uh, average American needs to be able to see um, certain things. Now, if I had to choose, I guess the, if I had to make like one ad to attack this idea, I guess it would be that taxation is theft. I think that that idea really needs to cha- needs to be attacked and sort of made fun of in certain ways. And I'm, you know, I'm a filmmaker, and so I try and uh, holy shit! Oh man, a car accident just happened behind me. Um, Were they wearing a seatbelt? I, I, so I, I'm so. trying to. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it looks like they're okay, but um, yeah, I, I would try and attack taxation and stuff because I think that there's a lot of just middle American, hardworking people, a lot of servers and bartenders who see their tips and stuff getting taken out and they see it as theft. And we really need to understand, get them to understand that there's a much bigger heist of money that's happening at a much higher level that's affecting them in ways that they can't see. And I think making them more aware of that, that's, that's probably where I would go. But again, I'll just uh, listen to what you guys have to say uh, off air, I guess. All right, cool. Thank I'll you for you taking my call. No, thank you. No, I think those points are, are obvious. And I think, you know, at the heart of it, he's saying funny, entertaining content that spreads the message and shows people, you know, what things could be like. And I think there are a lot of different uh, leftist shows that do that. I think this show, for one, uh, does that. Um, and the, 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 I guess the, the, the thing there is that we all are in our little bubbles and that the people who are consuming these shows uh, tend to mostly be leftists. Or, or people who are left of center. Um, but, you know, the question is for me, twofold. One, 
how effective were those crash test dummy ads? I know you said that they helped, but I would love to see uh, any data or research that ties uh, ties to it. I mean, I'm sure they were all over the place. I remember them. Maybe they made a TV show, like a cartoon for kids afterwards uh, off of it. So they were certainly popular. Um, but the second thing is, imagine if the current uh, like media, uh, out, out, like all the media outlets that exist today, all the different mediums we have, like the internet existed in the 80s when these crash test dummy ads were out there telling people to wear their seatbelt. Like you could imagine what it would have been like. It'd be like, uh, oh, did you guys see this crash test dummy ad? If you put it on Facebook and then you get a hundred comments on Twitter or Facebook or whatever saying, oh, did you hear who funds them? This is a government plot to, you know, hold you in your car. And, you know, it, it would, it would just con- on like. On top of TV channels being way decentralized compared to the eighties. Right. 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 And then you'd have the Fox news segments. You have Tucker Carlson on there throwing up that ad and saying like, Oh, this is what they're trying to do to destroy the white family, telling them to wear their seatbelt. I mean, you know, like the the medium, the media uh, uh, world is a lot different than it was in the 80s. And unfortunately, like, I think that would definitely hinder whatever, you know, the crash test dummies would have been able to do today. Uh, yeah. uh, just to jump in real quick, I think the caller made a good point, uh, you know, and Emma, just to echo just to echo Emma's point, you know, I see it more akin to the anti-smoking cessation push by the government in the sense that like, you know, you can have these kinds of intellectual campaigns running. You can tell people that smoking is bad for you, but ultimately, you know, even back then people are still going to be dealing with years and years of indoctrination in terms of what it means to be a smoker. It's actually healthy for you. We smoke on planes and to actually garner a significant amount of social and uh, social movement on the issue, it requires a two-pronged approach, approach, something like a material consequence or material boon for smoking. Like, hey, you can't smoke indoors. You, you're not, you know, smoking causes, I mean, rather cigarettes cause, cost more money than they used to in certain places. Uh, and to that first point, it creates another sort of social stigma along with smokers. Smokers are responsible for polluting the air inside, so they have to smoke outside. It creates a new category of person, smoker and non-smoker, right? Which it, by necessity alienates some people who otherwise would not be alienated because of a behavior that now we socially find as deleterious to people on a you know, public health level. And I think what we're missing now, along with the ability to like make messages stick because people are in a lot of these silos is, you know, the willingness of the government to back any kind of real sort of social push, any sort of real cultural push to change things with any kind of real material consequence or um, benefit for doing it. And so where I think on the left, we can learn from this message is not the ability to really instill kind of like large scale material consequences or benefits for being a leftist, but be more open to the idea of the left as more of a social thing, fulfilling a social uh, hole that people's lives have now due to being alienated as a result of capitalism that they're looking to fill oftentimes with a lot of these media properties. And, you know, be a little bit less intellectual, be a little bit less of this is a classroom or this, this is fine for people to go to the DSA or whatever meeting they want to go to just to make friends. I think there has to be a level of willingness to engage with people who are just there to fit in and be cool, as long as they're willing to entirely adopt and mirror those kinds of values, because ultimately what we're trying to do is launder our talking points into mainstream. And so just like with the anti-smoking and the seatbelt stuff, what you want is for people to be, you know, <laughs> I hate to say it, proper propagandize with leftism to the point that when they see their friend smoking, you know, or for talking about taxation being theft, they go, I know you believe that that's crazy. Like, you know, you want people to have that kind of confidence that comes from having a social group, you know, that believes the same thing to be able to sort of pressure people outside to, you know, adopt better habits. You know, even if we're only doing it on a micro scale, I think where we have that problem now is that everyone is so constant, you know, so constantly against the idea that you can shame anybody for anything that, you know, the idea of stigmatizing something that's not leftism, which is just an inherent necessity of, uh, you know, building a political movement is just not something that a lot of people would be willing to, you know, co-sign. But ultimately speaking, yeah, I want people to go to their jobs and, you know, laugh at some, I laugh at some idea that they read in the New York Times, like op-ed section, because it's just, it's crazy that people believe that. It's crazy that people still believe, you know, that smoking is good 50 years later. It has, you know, leftism has to become common sense for at least a small portion of the population. Right. I, I do think though, for the, the example of smoking, I, I do think a lot of those 
uh, regulations had a lot to do with it, maybe even more so than the anti-smoking campaigns. Like, sure, those anti-smoking campaigns definitely made it uncool to smoke, like, especially for young people. I do feel like there was definitely like, that shit's disgusting. Why would you want to do that? And less young people smoked, like it was no longer a, a cool thing to do. But at the same time, like I remember, you know, I was going to shows in, in New York when they were still smoking aloud in bars. And it was it was gross. People did it, though. And yeah. then I, I noticed the huge change that when those laws passed and just a lot of people just stopped smoking when it no longer became a social thing to do. They just, you know, stopped smoking. The, the problem here, though, is that I think that's a lot easier to 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 make happen, do, you know, to, to help people not smoke. Than it is to get people vaccinated because you know it, 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 there are similarities there there are similar things you could do but but it's a it's a it's a lot different in many ways too i also think this is a political fight and not like one in the hearts and minds of the people like look at even uh um the seatbelt fight that was like ralph nader wrote a book about how the auto industry was not doing roll cages and doing not seat belts and all these other unsafe things and the auto industry like literally tried to um uh trap him with a honeypot um a, a sex worker and getting him in trouble if memory serves to shut him up about that stuff because they didn't they wanted to save money by not having to do this stuff so this was all like right wing um or, or i guess industry um filtered through like places like the laissez fair foundation and the a foundation for economic um, freedom or whatever the hell these like right wing think tanks are. And I think like ultimately it was solved probably not so much by commercials, but by actually legislation in right. New York where it's like, we're just going to require this and they can continue fighting and trying to say like, actually it's making people less safe because they're driving, you know, more recklessly when they wear seatbelts. But that, that sort of nonsense ultimately can't stand up to legislation. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't think this kind of thing is going to work for like the anti-vaccine push, because at that point, like you said, Matt, we're just too, people are too used to getting their ideas from polarized like news sources for any kind of meme to penetrate. Just generally, though, I think speaking to the idea of a sort of meme propaganda push from the left, it, it's something that, you know, I think would be beneficial for, you know, building a more social cohesion. People should think leftism is cool. They shouldn't be, you know, afraid to you know, go out there and uh, wear their Bernie flags or whatever people are obsessed with now. Yeah. Wolfie59 and on the IM says, making not wearing a seatbelt a ticketable offense is what changed people's minds. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's sort of what I said too with the, the law changes with smoking where you couldn't mm -hmm. smoke inside anymore. So why are you going to go outside and be all by yourself smoking? You just won't smoke. And then little by little, you smoke less. But yeah it really does come down to something like that. And I mean, ticketing people, there's nothing people hate more than getting a ticket. So why not wear a seatbelt? Problem is a lot of this stuff isn't like, again, similarities, but not really completely transferable over to the anti-vaxxer stuff. Cause people will make the argument, you know, if I don't want to wear a seatbelt, I could also just choose not to drive a car then sure. But you know, if we start ticketing people who don't get vaccinated, I guess it would be, I mean, I honestly, would I have a problem with that? But um, there would be lots of people uh, who do more so than the usual, like right wing anti-vaxxers, which would obviously hinder the idea if that's what you're anyone wants to get at. Well, no, I think that, you know, the smoking argument is a little bit more of a parallel because what makes the going outside the smoke thing much more powerful than not wearing a seatbelt just or like being ticketed for some people is that, you know, you, you're, you're forced to leave the situation with your friends and you're going outside, you know, you're like, you, everything is going to continue without you. It seems minor, but you're being ostracized. The attempt to do the same thing with vaccine passports and that kind of sort of, uh, um, you know, you can't come in here unless you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. That's just a nightmare and can't work because of the type of thing that vaccination is. And ultimately, from a public health le level, they're just different things. You know, we can't live in a society where some states still have smoking laws. And I mean, we can live in a society where some states still have smoking inside allowed and some states don't you know, marginally. We can't live in a society where some states, you know, allow vaccinations to happen and some states don't. That that's just, you know, that's the same thing with gun violence. Like, yeah, it just, it trickles right. over by necessity. Right. Right. Well, I wanted to talk about this since uh, obviously it is my, uh, you know, Thursday, right? I get to have some selection of these clips and uh, Bender, it's a sports clip. All right, see you guys in about, uh, I don't know, 10 minutes? But it's actually, it's actually relevant because it's fascinating. It's about vaccines. Um, 
Carson Wentz, who's the new quarterback of the Indianapolis Colts, known Bible thumper. Sorry, I guess that's a derogatory term, but maybe not really. Uh, and North Dakotan. So it's a North Dakota boy. North Dakota boy. Um, he's one of a string of players who have this response to uh, when he's asked about whether or not he's vaccinated. Now, the NFL has instituted the policy that's more stringent than even, say, what California is doing, what New York State is doing, what uh, Biden's doing with federal agencies, where if you're not vaccinated, you're tested, but not daily. The NFL is testing you daily if you are not vaccinated. And a lot of players are having an issue with it. This is kind of an example of the standard response that you hear. Yeah, get me more. Yeah, I mean, the, the COVID situation is real. You, you mentioned it. Um, decision as far as vaccines is everybody's personal decision, you know, and uh, I like around here we respect and, and respect everybody's decision one way or the other. And, and we're going to rally together and follow the protocols and do everything we can um, to do nothing to derail this season. You know, we got a lot to, to play for, a lot at stake. Um, and a lot of guys are excited for it, so we're not going to let that be a distraction. All right, but Resovich is sports speak. So we're going to rally together. As individuals making yeah. our own choices. So that's what also is relevant is that last year, because of COVID outbreaks, the league had to bend over backwards to reschedule games in a 17 week season where it's very finite and the games are played on three specific days one on Thursday, one on Monday, sometimes two, and then the rest of them are on Sunday, and the, ske- the schedule is, is very set. Um, it had to be rescheduled all the time because of COVID outbreaks. So this year they've said that if there's a COVID outbreak on a team and they're unable to play, they forfeit. And so these players are making active, active decisions. They are all about win. I win first. Winning is the number one priority. They've become so indoctrinated against vaccines. Um, You had like stars like DeAndre Hopkins tweeting out anti-vax stuff and et cetera, that they are willing to, even though they'll inject themselves with Toradol if their arm is falling off so that they can keep playing, not get vaccinated, and then say it's a personal choice and not reveal the status of whether or not they're vaccinated when by the way player health is revealed on a weekly basis they'll have day-to-day updates on if this guy's knees okay uh if you know his groin's okay because it affects betting markets etc which by the way this does too um they're now making it about a personal choice it's just this insane cognitive dissonance when their health is on full display all the time in this league because there's so much money at stake and they want to win above all else they say this is how deep this runs i love when people say they don't want to share if they've been vaccinated or not because that's that's the clearest thing as to what the answer is like if it if you're someone who needs to say you're vaccinated uh because that's what the people who support you or your industry or whatever expects of you and you won't share that then obviously you're not vaccinated but then look at marjorie taylor green who a few weeks ago her whole community loves that they believe she's anti-COVID, she's a COVID denier, anti, she's got to be an anti-vaxxer, right? Her, in her case, she should be shouting from the rooftops that she's not vaccinated. But when she was asked, she refused to answer it. Clearest tell in my estimation that she's been vaccinated. I mean, if you know, it's so easy to just share this. It's so funny when they won't say anything. The incentive is opposite here, right? It's it's right. Refer- because that you know people want to know that their players are vaccinated um and they've literally had two that i can remember there was a vikings coach who was fired because he refused to get vaccinated the the nflpa negotiated that they don't have to require vaccinations um but that doesn't apply to coaches fired because he wouldn't get vaccinated and the patriots assistant it just happened so uh, i mean i i I, I cannot square this concept of win, 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 win at all costs. But this provides us with a strategic disadvantage. We'd have to forfeit if there was an outbreak and they're still not going to get the vaccine when more than half of American adults have gotten the vaccine. And they'll put anything in their body to be successful as long as I guess they've grown up with it. But it, like... Can someone shed light on this dynamic other than me? Because I still, I'm a little bit at a loss. 
I don't know. I feel like this has been this is a problem that's been brewing for a while in America, and it's just being incredibly. I mean, it's being revealed very, you know, uh, drastically by COVID nineteen and the sort of necessities that come from needing to have a cognitive, sorry, a coherent public health strategy. In the sense that you know, a lot of anti vaxxing prior to COVID nineteen felt like you know another fringe conspiracy theory was being promoted by you know a handful of rich people, but you know it wasn't out of step with a lot of other weird conspiracy theories like that the aliens are controlling the government you know classic things you know this strain of anti-vaxxerism or whatever you want to call it it seems a lot more akin to like that just weird trend of republicans burning all of their trash or, or burning a hundred dollars worth of nikes or you know their new keurig machine for the past like a year and a half whenever they didn't like anything now not being vaccinated is not even really a health thing for a lot of these people it's a symbolic political stand and i think that's where it becomes you know this incredibly po uh, polarized world we have a uh, media that kind of is so detethered from like the material consequences of these like silly little like tantrums Republicans throw was just gearing us up for. It's like now people see this as, you know, a political stand that they might have to take. You know, I was reading an article a little bit ago where people were not going to the hospital because when they were suffering with COVID because they didn't want Trump's numbers of COVID right. uh, victims to go up. It's like, that, that's insane, you know, and there's very little I think we can do about it in the moment without dealing with the sort of undercurrent of, you know, media that allows for people to just gin up controversy over nothing. Right, right. That's a great point about, you know, how, you know, anti-vaxxers prior to COVID were obviously a thing and they've been a thing for a long time, but they were much more of a fringe movement. I mean, obviously they, you know, you would hear every now and then about some uh, disease that was eradicated for decades. All of a sudden, like there was a small little, uh, you know, epidemic going around in like a small town somewhere because of some uh, anti-vaxxer parents who wouldn't get their kid vaccinated. But it comes down to like it took probably took a long time. Sure, this is what they dealt with uh, when all these other vaccines that we now just take for granted first came out. Um, but the, the fact is that we all get vaccinated when we're born. The majority of us get vaccinated and we just don't have a say in it because it's just so normal that our parents know that this is what's done to protect our children and make sure they can go to school and take part in other activities that children do that they can't do if they're not vaccinated. Um, and so they do it and we all grow up and we all get to this point where we're healthy enough to say, I'm not injecting a vaccine in my body when it comes to COVID, whereas there's already about, what, a dozen vaccines already uh, flowing through your body since birth would have died of measles before if you were truly anti-vax but like i just want another nfl wrinkle which is fascinating ron rivera who's the head coach of the washington football team he's a cancer survivor and he went out and he said he's quote beyond frustrated that some of his players aren't getting vaccinated that even though he is vaccinated he's immune deficient and still has to wear masks at meetings and this former player tj ward responded to him don't blame the players for your lifelong health decisions his health is beyond that of COVID. Maybe it's time to let it go. At some point, you got to pay for them vices. Cancer runs in my family, like many American families, but also bad diets and cigarettes do as well. Accept responsibility. Don't Holy. and be disappointed in your 23-year-olds because they have their own bodies and opinions about their health. Personal responsibility. You got to show it. You know, If you get cancer, it's because you weren't personally responsible for not getting cancer. Exactly. I mean, right? It's not your personal responsibility to take care of your health to not get COVID by getting a vaccine. But he's personally responsible for getting cancer? And he has no idea if he smokes cigarettes in his life? That There's a, a ton of people who get cancer and have healthy diets, never smoked in their life, done nothing to attribute, even contribute to it. She's, it's, she's at fault, but my mother's at fault because her, her parents smoked around her as a kid, maybe, and that might have been one of the factors for breast cancer. Insane. I mean, it's crazy, but that's an underlying, I feel like that's just an underlying thing people more or less believe in America. Like, if you get sick, it must be your fault, because otherwise, how, like, how do you justify bankrupting people for it? Yes. You know, like it, like you you don't often hear it so bluntly, but like, yeah, this is what people more or less believe or the assertion of what they believe. Like, yeah, if you don't believe that you can prevent yourself from getting ill uh, in some real coherent way, that like it's entirely up to you and sort of like, you know, 
contextless agency, then like, how do you justify bankrupting people for like car accidents, you know, or for like, you know, getting hit by a bus that was out of their control or something you can't. So I mean, it's just the next step, you know, someone vocalizing what just America believes about sickness, about health, that it's up to you to make sure you don't ever get sick. Right. I mean, it's just not, it's just not sickness and health though. Like this is a belief and ideology that permeates throughout all of a culture here in the United States. I mean, it, it comes right from Reagan, the idea that, you know, you are, you know, it, does this take, just look at like, you know, the biz, business culture, how, you know, all the, uh, so many young people today want to be an entrepreneur so they could say, I did that, where even if they were successful in some ways, they don't ever uh, attribute it to the people who helped them get there or any, so, you know, look at, look at our current billionaires out there thinking they're some sort of a g- tech geniuses or whatever we're talking about certain uh tech billionaires without real without even paying attention to the uh the subsidies they get elon musk shared a meme the other day about how he doesn't trust the government or something like that meanwhile the guy's bankrolled by billions of dollars in subsidies from the united states and contracts from the government to send his satellites up there i mean the dude is basically where he is because of government subsidies and money. And here he is saying he doesn't trust the government because he's trying to play up this idea that he's some sort of lone rebel who did this all himself and he's successful on his own and no one can tell him what to do. He doesn't need anybody. Like this is the idea that permeates everything throughout the culture here. Like that is American culture. Like we talk about what American culture is. That is it. That disgusting ideology that your the personal responsibility is the gold standard and it's where everything is. This is yeah. uh, Republicans need to play footsie with this stuff, even though it might ultimately bad be bad for like you know um, certain parts of business. Even though you know obviously not the highest highest of the heights, because this is a sentiment that they are naturally ready to sort of harvest. Um, and I, obviously they've contributed to stoking it, um, you know, with Trump and all that stuff. But also this is this is like you said, this is American culture. Um, the other to, to a certain extent, this is bipartisan. This idea that people uh, have to you know worry about their own uh, health in a way that's like you know if you get cancer, um, I, that's part of America, and that's what the Republicans need in term in um in terms of a base in terms of um you know turning people out. So. I think that's why like people are saying why are they doing this even though like the best thing for the economy in the long run would be to get everybody vaxxed and then um and then you know get business going again it's because of this reason they need to appeal to this to a certain extent yeah no absolutely you know you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. you know i think there was an underappreciation for the potentiality that we would need people to be able to listen to basic instructions in this country without being confused by multiple voices acting independently for selfish reasons like at huge platforms saying you know different things either you know to gin up money for uh, their new uh, endeavor or just because they think they're a virology genius amongst many other types of genius you know it just it just seems like it couldn't have put us in a worse position for dealing with a health crisis that we're dealing with right now. And, you know, while we're dealing with it, we're still dealing with this kind of need to play footsie, like Matt was saying, with, well, if we give people the tools to better discern fact from fiction, what will that mean in the long run for our entire political media apparatus? You know, like, we don't have a Democrat on the opposite side of the Republicans really arguing for the value of the public sector, arguing for like the value of society as a whole, you know, a whole organism versus like, well, if every individual person gets vaccinated, then they can party, which seems to be their line. <laughs> and that's not sort of like, it's, it's not the, it's, appealing and it might work to get a few people out you know like the lotteries and like the promise of things going back to normal but it's not really combating the underlying problem of people just not seeing themselves as part of a society right um i wanted to also talk about this chris cuomo thing if everybody uh... oh, this was insane oh my god i mean i can't believe they even oh boy let's go ahead <laughs> <laughs> the uh, just sort of like pure channeling of Ameri- a certain type of American spirit. Uh, we got a restaurant tier for you here. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, Italian v. Italian crime. That's what we have here. This is so quick. <laughs> I just want to set it up a little more. Chris Cuomo uh, interviewed a restaurant owner. And it's about how he has a sign outside of his 
um, outside of his restaurant that says he will only serve unvaccinated people, basically. So it's very silly. Chris Cuomo takes offense to the representation of his Italian heritage, eh? Uh, and uh, this is, that's a little bit too much of a through line in the segment that is hilarious for many reasons. Anyway, Tony Roman is the owner of Basilico's Pasta e Vino, and he joins me now from inside his restaurant. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> And you said the name perfectly. You said it perfectly. Good job. Now I know you're Italian. It's because I speak the language. Let me okay. guess. You don't. But here's what I'm asking it. you. Tony. I love it. Is this uh, a little bit of a joke? Can you, get, can you give me some hope that uh, you really don't want people okay. to not get vaccinated so they can come to your restaurant? That's a good, that's a good question. Uh, you're a smart guy. It's an IQ test. And like I say, say to people when they ask me, press, press pause if they're second. so blinded. It, it, it is absolutely an IQ test, just not in the way he meant it. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it's a charisma check. Uh, see if that you are roll 20. <laughs> Keep going. Uh, with, you know, with their rage and their hate, I tell them, you know what? If you still don't understand it, uh, maybe we should put up a sign up that says you're too stupid to come into the restaurant. I mean, it's very simple. Just like you said, I think you figured it out. Am I right? I don't even know what you're saying right now. Tell me, we're so what's the deal? Point. I'm saying we're making a point. And so... You answered the question. So you haven't been vaccinated. Nobody in your family's been vaccinated. If I answer that, are you, you going to answer that when I ask you? Yeah, sure. Ask me whatever you want. Now answer my question. Uh, I'm not vaccinated. Are you? Uh, I am. How about your, your parents, uh, your, your wife, your kids? You were hesitant. No, I got vaccinated. I'm gonna, have to, I, I'm gonna ask you this. So, wait, what does that prove when he says uh, that he was hesitant, which he wasn't? It's just the delay. It's he's he's acting from the like broadcast. the most unprepared cop of all time. I like, know. No, I was hesitant, you idiot. <laughs> like, I think I think these guys actually really do believe that like liberal coastal elite media is telling us to do things they don't do themselves. Honestly, I really do think that's what some of these guys believe. So when- California. so when California! He's in Huntington Beach, well, California! Please, please, you know this is like one of those guys. But um, look how he's treating uh, Cuomo, who deserves to be treated this way for other reasons. But uh, <laughs> but this is the idea that he was expecting Cuomo, I guess, to, to actually hesitate or not want to share that information. That honestly is what I think he was expecting, is that was just his prepared, that's what he prepared, to call oh, Chris Cuomo out for hesitating. So when he didn't, it unravels from here. Hold on, but but we need this is this is Italian on Italian crime. We probably should have given a warning before the segment, just because, based on the uh, the provocative nature of this uh, mob boss cosplayer speaking with Cuomo. Yeah, he had that prepped, but it it, I don't, it doesn't work out for him here on out. Vaccinated? Are you? Uh, I am. How about your your parents, uh, your your wife, your kids? You were hesitant. No, I got vaccinated. I'm gonna have to, I, I'm gonna ask you the same. I'm gonna ask you the same thing. Is that all right? Yeah, go ahead. Is your, no, is your family vaccinated? Yes. See what you're not get, what you're not getting. You're, you're 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 failing the IQ test. What you're not getting, which I expected. Um, what you're not getting is that uh, this is not this is not an anti-vaccine stand. It's a pro-freedom stand. That's what you're not getting. What is the difference when you are ignoring? the science that suggests that if you get vaccinated you protect yourself you protect the people around you and you help us get out of this pandemic a little bit faster so what's next then are we all going to lock ourselves in our homes uh, uh whenever there's a what a flu outbreak or or there's an outbreak of a cold a common cold are we going to lock ourselves in, inside our homes and wear a moon suit i mean where does it end it ends with you getting the vaccine so that this virus doesn't keep replicating and creating variants oh uh, no wait no the, i wanted a little bit more there was a little bit more there was a little bit more. i just want to i just want to say the whole idea that this isn't an anti-vaccine stance but a proof of freedom stance i mean if you're someone who just doesn't care then why wouldn't you just say 
this restaurant's open for everybody, <laughs> vaccine or not. Why not let people have the freedom to get it or not? He is making an anti-vaccine sentiment by saying, I only serve the unvaccinated. I mean, that doesn't even make any sense. What, do people not have the freedom to get it if they want? Is that what this guy's saying? Yes, it's exactly an anti-freedom stance because if it was a pro-freedom stance, he wouldn't care if you were vaccinated or not. Fine, make a sign that says unvaccinated people are welcome here, but vaccinated people are welcome too. So it's not necessarily the freest of stances. I, I mean, I, I go on, Brandon. No, I was just going to say it, it's it's weird because I think that, you know, right wing media has been conditioning people to make these very, very like big, really very, very big tantrums. And that it's not weird and like off putting when you put a sign on your door that says unvaccinated only. It's an IQ test like that, that. That's just a normal thing to do. And then to complain when you go on the news with Chris Cuomo and he's just like, why are you being so weird? Uh, because you weren't expecting such, a, you know, the obvious question. Right. I think that like I was saying before, you know, far right media has conditioned these people to exist in these little online bubbles and then go out into the world making these grand gestures only to be you know confronted with the reality that a lot of people around them just especially if you're a small business owner who like a, I want to say a pizzeria owner but you didn't say it was a pizzeria I guess I just kind of assumed um uh is oh geez I know right assumptions I'm making assumptions there and that's that's very problematic of me although i had no idea that the i and iq stood for italian right. i thought it was like intelligent quotient but it's, it's obviously something different so i, I italian, my face is, Q, italian q italian that's what it stands for my, my fa- boy is my face red and white and then green uh but no i mean i think you know it teaches them to make these grand gestures not only just for fun and ideology sakes for like to show that you are a freedom loving American, but also there's profit to be made in like putting a sign on your door saying it's unvaccinated. If you can get the kind of attention and build a market for like other far right people to come there, or even just start a GoFundMe when you inevitably face backlash, which makes this, you know, another layer of danger when you have made it so easily commodifiable or easy to commodify these inherently antisocial stances like racism or vaccines are bad. So even when people may or may not believe them, who knows how much he believes like the anti-vaccine stance, they may instead be encouraged by the ability to make money by doing something like this. Like, oh yeah, I'll just have a a no vax, an unvaccinated only coffee shop because everyone in town, you know, is a vaccine, you know, requires vaccines. So this is an easy way to make money and I'll brand it that way. And I'll, you know, cater to the far right. And that's just a legitimate business model in America now, not only just in the media, but in consumable goods. Well, why stop there? I mean, he should start branding his dishes there as COVID related uh, pasta dishes, right? We got he, licks, he licks every dish. Yeah, it's my restaurant is unsanitary. Hey, hey, we don't believe in science here. We don't wash our plates. Oh, this is this is not good. <laughs> this is not a good Italian accent. <laughs> Mamma mia. I feel like you guys are really doing a lot of uh, work to bury my pizzeria comment. Thank you. <laughs> I uh, I was hoping someone would take up the mantle of the of the of the accent. But... I don't have when I try to do an Italian accent, it just sounds like Waluigi because I play that's my wow. main character in like the in uh, Mario Party. So like I'm not gonna do it. Listen, I'm I'm partially Italian, so everything that happens on this show that could be perceived as anti-Italian while I'm here gets a pass. That's how it works. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, do you guys want to go to the phones? Sure. <laughs> seven five seven. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Corey from Indianapolis. Hey, Corey from Indianapolis. What would you like to talk about? So, um, fortunately, some sad news from Indiana. There was an in-custody uh, police killing that happened recently. If it's okay to talk about that. Sure. Yeah. What happened? All right. So, the victim's name was um, Taniasha Chappell. She's 23 years old. She's from Louisville, Kentucky. And she shoplifted um, in southern Indiana, stole about $2,300 worth of stuff from a polo store, and then uh, ran from the police. Um, they stopped her at one point. And as they were trying to get her out, get her out of the car, uh, she tried to sped off and hurt one of the police. And then they uh, chased her down and got her later. So that's uh, what she was in jail for. Um, while she was in jail, she kept calling her parents like every day and saying that 
she feared for her life and said that they were going to kill her in there. And um, she also said that they left a noose on her bed uh, multiple times. So she felt like something bad was going to happen. Um, on July 15th, she started getting sick, uh, throwing up a lot, and had a really high fever. Now, this the county jail she was in in Brownstown doesn't regularly have medical staff, so they didn't help her at all. And then the next day, it got so bad that they took her to the local hospital, and she ended up dying there. Jeez. And it looks like she might have been poisoned or something. The uh, autopsy report has already been done. It was done on July 18th, but they are still not releasing it. Um, the lawyers that took the Breonna Taylor case have already taken this, and um, they've uncovered some pretty, pretty crazy stuff about this jail. Um, I guess there were two other recent deaths that weren't really reported, that were just kind of covered up. So that's pretty crazy to hear. Um, one other thing that they that I found interesting that they uncovered is that this jail um, has reported zero COVID cases since the beginning of the pandemic. Well, maybe they're just very cleanly so, and really careful and all the cops wear masks there. No. Um, but yeah, that's, that's um, I mean, not entirely, I mean, her specific case is, is horrible, but um, everything else you mentioned about that, host- that yeah. jail is not terribly surprising, to be honest. Well, it's funny, it's, it's funny you mentioned the cleanliness. Um, another thing that I guess inmates have complained about for a long time is they have sewage problems there where the toilets overflow into the cells. And this is made even worse because um, in a lot of the cells, they sleep on like a one inch mat on the floor. So like they're literally sleeping in sewage sometimes. Oh. Thanks for yeah. calling and letting us know about this case. I'm actually looking it up right now. I'm going to do yeah, some reading. No problem. On it. I um, appreciate it, uh, putting it on my radar. Yeah. Let me spell her uh, first name real quick. I, I, I found it's, it. It's uh, T-A apostrophe. Oh, you got it. Yeah. T-A apostrophe yeah, N-E-A-S-H-A. Yep. Yep. I appreciate and like the I call. said, uh, they got some big name lawyers on it. So uh, hopefully they'll get some justice. Yeah. Well, we'll right. see. Thanks for, taking my call. Thanks for calling in. Thank you. You guys want to go to uh, one more uh, call and then we'll go to another uh, story or video or something? Sure. Yeah, no, sure. Definitely. I'm just going to say quickly, you, if for no other reason, you would think that just the conditions of America's prisons and the uh, number of imprisoned Americans would you know, cause most American love, America loving Americans, I guess, for lack of a better term, to like pause about the moral superiority of our country. But it, you know, through a combination of, I guess, it being buried as normal for here, because we have an inborn minority population, or for any number of other reasons, like people just do not engage critically with the atrocity that is our prison industrial complex, you know, and just like how it's like, just uh, full stop, like torturous and inhumane. It's sort of just like, you know, for the, just the slavery, every other aspect of it, it's, it's gross. It's wild. Absolutely. And, and you know, speaking about what, what I, I, this caller told us about uh, this woman's particular case, you know, there's gonna be people having our personal responsibility conversation earlier who say, oh, well, you know what she did getting away from the cops and, and, you know, there was an act, she injured an officer, you know, she, you know, but no one's saying anything about that. The idea that she deserved to be put to death, the police were judge, jury, executioner in a hospital, in a, in a, excuse me, in a jail cell. Uh, that's the issue here. I mean, if she did something wrong and obviously uh, she went through the system, the justice system and the jury of her peers found that she did something wrong and she was handed a, uh, a, um, a, a, uh, a, outcome that's consequential to what she did uh then sure but that's not what happened here uh let's go to uh 570 what's your name where are you calling from hello uh, hello hi you're on the air hi uh this is brian in the poconos um i hope everybody's doing okay today um i was actually calling in um I didn't know if you guys had seen, there's actually a story circulating uh, from Pennsylvania, York County, where um, the Trump audit sociopaths are knocking on doors trying to find out who voted for who. Uh Uh, And that dropped this morning. So my question is, at what point, um, 
at what point are we going to start just kind of like telling the truth about what the GOP voter base has become and it's just like a fascist nightmare, <laughs> I guess. Right. Well, I mean, I think I uh, we're trying to do that a little bit here. Yeah, I, yeah mean, I mean, I listen to you guys almost every day. I, I think like my concern is, and I interact with quite a few liberals, uh, not leftists, I mean like liberals. Right. Um, they, they, you know, the reliance they tend to have is, oh, well, we'll just wait for the courts to sort this out. But I mean, at, at, like, that's not really good enough. Um, and I don't see the sense of urgency among the people that kind of have, I mean, the left, as leftists, we know we have very limited power in this country, of all countries. Um, at least politically. So my, my concern is like, they're just like sitting on their asses and, and waiting for the courts to save them. But uh, throughout history, like every fascist movement has taken power pretty much through the legality of the court system in the country they're in. So I, I don't know how uh, we, we should be broaching that generally, because these liberals just don't seem to really have any sense of urgency in confronting it. I don't know. I don't know particularly what I, I agree with you on, on a number of things, but in terms of these audits, which I think most people obviously see as a joke, the problem with the audits is they are fomenting the idea that this is uh, electoral fraud among their base so that their base really uh, gets ingrained in their mind and cemented that this is the truth and the absolute truth. Problem here, though, is like what can be done? This is all at the state level in states that uh, from what I've seen, maybe I'm wrong on one or two of them, but from uh, from what I've seen, every state that's having one of these audits is uh, run by Republicans, Republican uh, state uh, Senate. Uh, I don't know what can be done to stop them from doing this, right? I mean... Right, and I think it's more like a public engagement sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I, I fancy myself like a libertarian-style socialist, uh, which I'm sure Sam would take issue with libertarian, <laughs> but... Uh, but but generally speaking, you know, I, I poll watched in the in the 2020 election simply because, um, you know, throughout throughout 2020, after the, you know, the murder of George Floyd and stuff, um, we've seen a lot of growth of like far right ethno nationalist groups up here. Um, you know, and I, I'm a member of BSA, I'm a member of the, the Socialist Rifle Association. So I kind of like know a lot about like the street movements and things like that, especially in this area. And it's just expanding. I mean, you have like Tucker Carlson normalizing white nationalist rhetoric about great replacement. It's just, it's, to me, the concern is like, yeah, we can't do anything legally because they kind of like love to skirt this legal gray area where it's like, yeah, it's legal. You know, it's, it, it might be unethical, but it's legal. There's nothing illegal. There's nothing illegal. You know, and that type of thing, it, it's like entrenching itself in a lot of the liberals that I talk to that are like, well, you know, they're not breaking the law. We'll just have to see what the courts say. So I like, I don't know how uh, we can confront that, like, on, like in a street epistemological sense of like confronting these people and talking to them and adding a sense of urgency to what's being done before it's too late. Right. I guess that's my concern. Um, right. but yeah, I understand like legally, I mean, we don't have any power. I can't like go into the PA state courthouse and be like, yo, what are you doing? <laughs> But, but even even in, in this specific case, again, I don't know what like even even not even if you you say like, you know, obviously not all laws are 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 just. But even in this case, like, what would you do? Like, just go over there and like physically try to stop the audit. Like, I'm not quite sure what could be done in, in, in these specific situations. Um, the audits are going to happen because the Republicans in those states have the power to make those audits happen. No, I mean, I agree that. Right. Right. Happen. And I uh, and- Oh, Brandon, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, if it happens, it happens. I think it's more about like, like you know, controlling the discourse and the messaging, um, and and kind of the discussions I've had with people about this specific incident in York, uh, York County, which is like sixty-seven percent Republican. Um, the conversations I've had with them, it's it's just like complete disaster on the Democratic side. Like no one's saying anything of relative value, and it seems to me like a lot of people are afraid to speak. Um, so like controlling the messaging, like they're just dominating the messaging, the Republican Party and, and their operatives. And I mean, the real problem with the Republican Party is the voter base. Um, but in general, like they just dominate the messaging. So this seems rational, like asking the question. And while people may think it's a joke, I mean, yeah, I agree with you. They think it's a joke, but but like buffoonery is kind of a feature of fascist movements. I mean, Hitler was a drunk bohemian. So <laughs> 
Brent, I, I don't know. I just, I feel like it's hopeless. Like no one can control the narrative to like fight back on this stuff. Right. Uh, Brandon, what were you going to say? I was going to say I broadly agree with the caller's point. I think that, you know, the lack of urgency in liberals and, you know, sort of like a upper middle class sect of like, you know, Democrat aligned liberal voters is by design. You know, the lack of urgency, the sort of overabundance of faith in there being time for things later is built into their ideology in order to, for, you know, for them to forget that, oh, climate change is happening right now. You know, generational politics is another facet of this. We're like, oh, yeah, you know, racism, climate change, all of the follies of the present will be solved in the future by some, you know, non-discreet thing that will happen. There'll be time for me to write my book or do my, live my life in my 60s or 70s. And so right now I'm going to slave away under, you know, uh, some tech job, job de jour that's 60, 80 hours a week with low pay and bad health care. It's like that has to be part of what they believe. Otherwise, you know, why do anything, right? If you don't believe that there's something, you know, at the end of this liberal rainbow, if the, like the arc of justice, I mean, if the arc of time doesn't trend towards justice, you might have to do something, you know? You might have to actually get up and show a little bit more proactivity. You might demand more from your, uh, from your politicians. And I think that that's where you see the Democrats uh, facilitating this uh, takeover by the fascist right, you know, this rise of anti-intellectualism on the far right. And even the, like, you know, one facet of this overabundance in time, Medicare for all, the idea that we were going to have time, you know, later to get everyone health care, you know, there wasn't going to be any long term consequences of less sort of our broken health system in the present, you know, COVID-19. COVID-19 happened and people who were saying that there was going to be time later, they rapidly found out that there it actually we ran out of time. And that's going to be true. And it has been true for a lot of things for a lot of people. But running out of time for things is something that, you know, is obscured by the media, I think, as a reality that Americans are facing daily, and that America itself is facing if we don't get things, you know, under control. So I think, you know, part of that is just challenging their ideology, maybe at, even at the personal level of like, you think you have time to write that book in your, when you're 65, because you found out that like five or six people over the, you know, in the history of the United States, you know, wrote their first novel when they were 90, got some bad news for you. You only know about those people because it doesn't happen. That's an exception that you're treating as a rule because otherwise, you know, you will be forced to deal with reality. And that's another facet of our, you know, our political media treating these exceptions to rules as though like they're actually examples of how you can do it. Like, no, write the book today, write the book tomorrow, you know, otherwise you might just die and never have a chance to. Uh, but definitely, you know, that's just the, my two cents on it. Hey, Brandon, did you hear about the- uh, Yeah, I think the, that that's- The Dogecoin millionaire? <laughs> The Dogecoin millionaire? <laughs> yeah, one of those exceptions. Yeah, that's all you hear about, those success stories with, uh, with, with everything, really. You never hear about the people who, who lose or, or fail it's or don't make it or with everything. I understand that it can be viewed as optimism, and I think it's good to have a healthy optimism. But, you know, when healthy optimism becomes like irrational rationality or some, you know, like if I save a dollar every day, I'll be able to afford, you know, a house by the time I'm 180 million. So therefore, I should, you know, I should take it under my personal responsibility. Like that, that's what America's be become. And it's, you know, it's time to like challenge that idea that there's going to be time for your kids to solve climate change. There's going to be time for, you know, you to save for retirement. Like you, if you're not doing it right now, you're probably not going to start because capitalism is going to keep you on that precipice of, you know, mal distribution of resources, of deficits, of, you know, debt until you die. All right. Uh, caller, any, any last word really quick before we jump? No, I mean, I think that that's, you know, great. I just, you know, it, it frustrates me to know and that people think the systems that enable this sort of fascist takeover are going to save them from it. So, you know, I, I think focusing on, you know, the, you know, what, what Brandon said about, you know, are you going to write the book? You're not going to write the book, you know, if you're, if you're dead. So write it now, you know. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for the call. Uh, what uh, is this? Uh, JJ Cool. Uh, is that it? No, that's not it. Um, Captain Rick on the IM says, what's Binder's take on the yard sign debate? In my opinion, Sam's take yesterday was pretty much as bad as they get. What was the yard sign debate, Emma? Should you have yard signs, like just generally, or like a specific type of yard sign? Because I have thoughts on the first part. I might, I might jump through the window. Yeah, I think we can skip it. I tweeted about the stupid yard signs and it like triggered a bunch of people. The ones that say that say 
in this house we believe science is real and uh and then oh. <laughs> oh those signs yeah those are i said these signs are for losers and it was the most controversial thing i've ever fucking said i guess if i were a con man i would go to i would only go to houses that had signs like that in this house we believe in science because i i would i think that it would be easy to trick them Sam was saying like it provides a safe haven for people in areas that might be red and i just like I'm not necessarily convinced by that argument, but I didn't want to talk about it so much that I just let him have it. All right. Well, I, I, my, 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 my mom doesn't have a yard, so she doesn't have the yard signs, but she has equivalent signs in her house, in her home. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, believe in this house, we, you know, those uplifting, like, I feel like they definitely, those, uh, those messages definitely appeal to a, a certain, generation uh of people and they they eat that they eat that be positive em shit up emma's were more the more liberal slogans of politics not like believe and like yes that sort yes of thing. and yeah I, I oh, mean, okay i mean i think it's a little silly but you know I, I walk past houses that have them all the time and i just like laugh to myself because like okay do you believe in science like you voted for like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. No offense, but like <laughs> you can't possibly believe in science that much. But yeah. yeah. The, the amount of people that voted for Bernie Sanders that have those signs, it's probably in terms yeah, of. Yeah, it, it's depressing. It, it's, it's depressing to walk through like, any Brooklyn neighborhood. You get a lot, you get a wide berth of signs. Yeah. It, I, is, it, it is definitely a normie thing. So maybe we are in the minority here of people who think they're. They're dumb or something. I don't mind being in a minority, generally speaking, but especially not here um, on the show and in this conversation, because like I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's eat, pray, love outside. Right. Yeah, it is live, laugh, love, except in signed version. And oh, okay. That economic policy on it. Right. Yeah. But eat, pray, love works too. Um, all right, guys. <laughs> let me is, read there, is, is there a clip you want to get to, Emma, or is that it? You want to just get some IMs? Not exactly. I have a little bit of a cold, so I'm like a little um, out of it. But uh, uh, Emma Pubbomner, I'm here to relitigate Emma's controversial tweet. Yeah, Binder, <laughs> no! I didn't know what was going on. I had no idea. I just, I saw someone ask me a question about the yard sign debate and they said Sam's take was horrible. And I was like, ooh, I got to know what Sam was horrible. <laughs> Whatever take Emma had about yard signs, I want to not only echo it, I want to, you know, make it 30 times more offensive. I stand with Emma on this yard sign issue. Yards, you know, lawns themselves. Yes. No bueno. I'm oh. taking a very hard yard stance. I think we should be anti-yard and literally like salting people's yards to the grass <laughs> dice, but that's me. Uh, okay, that's a little bit, not as hard as Matt's uh, anti-yard <laughs> stance, but, you know, somewhere in between Matt and Emma's anti-yard stances. You're right. Um, being an NFL player is a choice. If they don't agree with the company policy, they can always find new jobs. Am I doing the right wing thing correct? Says Maddie Light. Um, the trans uh, sister rodeo. Great interview, Emma. Very interesting subject matter. It confirmed a lot of what we saw in that Kevin Costner flick, Thirteen Days. Also, I've never seen that. Also, Pelosi is probably one of the worst liars. I've ever seen twitching so shoulders, raise eyebrows, body shifting, waving arms. It's obvious she doesn't believe a word she's saying, but she wants us to. It's shaking my damn head. Um, <clears throat> well, we we saw with like the mansion or the the sort of Exxon lobbyist thing. Like they just talk shit. Like they like when they go up there and they talk about the the Constitution stuff. They don't give a damn what they're saying. Pelosi never thought through what she was saying. It's just like a good enough thing to say no. <laughs> it's a right. way to say no. Right, exactly. Um, Sam Cedar's sexy gams. Christ. Uh, great first call. Tremendous. The caller is 100% correct, and we need to promote what America in the future looks like when government works for people instead of corporations and the military. Sterno says, if the CDC said there was a mass shortage but then advised people to wear them, it would make the shortage worse. I mean... Look what people did with toilet paper. The CDC was in a difficult position at the. At you point. don't lie. I'm sorry. I, you don't lie. Tell them we're having a shortage on masks, but like, or or just don't say anything. But if you lie using the channel of public health, you're going to f it up. I, I right. think 
really clear. Yeah, I understand they were in a tough position, but I, I agree. Um, Disco Stu says, "Did you see? Do you see any issue with the fact that Nina Turner campaigned with Jill Stein in Ohio in 2016, or that she spent last year doing events with Jimmy Dore and the Movement for People's Party? Just awful, awful." Judgment. No, I don't give a shit. And I think that um, all those people, I, I think the people that are turning on her as a sellout, I think you know that's a better problem for them. But no, I think she's great, and I think people should support her. And uh, I couldn't care less what she did. Fine. Did she? Did, did she even do that? I, I've never seen anything about her endorsing or supporting. They, they claim that, but there was a there's a video of her uh, Jill Stein speaking after her at something completely that had nothing to do with Jill Stein's uh, run for president in 2016. It was like a DNC like progressive event before the DNC, and she didn't mention Jill Stein or anything. It's just weird people just trying to yeah, make I, stuff up about her. I don't care if she was ambivalent about voting for Hillary in 20. Or yeah. like any of this, or or even t Biden in twenty twenty. Like people are allowed to say the truth that these people are unacceptable, but that Wait. we are because <laughs> we'll I'm sorry. Was, was that the event in Philadelphia in two thousand sixteen? I was at that event. I saw her speak there. <laughs> yeah, people are, people are using that clip to claim that here she is endorsing Jill Stein in twenty sixteen. I, I was there too, Brandon, but like we just didn't know each other at that point. Uh, yeah, it was a really hot day. Yeah, really hot. Take a photo with Nita Turner. It was it was great. Yeah, uh, I was there. For, yeah. I was there with Jimmy. Um, Were you really? Well, I was there for with Tyt and Jimmy. Was oh, okay. Oh, okay. Ooh, it was I really hot that like... day. Oh God, now uh, I'm having flashbacks. I honestly don't care if she was just literally uh, echoing everything Jimmy Dore was saying back then. I think her candidacy is rock solid, and people should support her. One hundred percent. It. I think it's on. Like. I'm annoyed to even like, I don't know, to, to entertain that stuff. Cause let that, let the other side do that stuff. Right. Right. So, someone pulled up a clip of Jimmy Dore from that time period. I don't know exactly what the year was. It was definitely that era of like mid 20, 2010s or whatever, 2015, 2016, 2017, whenever he was on TYT. And he's saying he's comparing treating people who used to work at Fox news as people who used to be part of the KKK. Uh, and he sounded like a, even you know, that would have been a lip take to his followers today. And here he is nowadays going on Fox News to, to hang out with Tucker Carlson every now and then. So, I mean, uh, clearly the guy had takes that weren't completely uh, the crazy uh, shit he would say now back then. Yeah, <laughs> he definitely got I mean, you could see seeds of it, but he definitely got more and more insane. Special father number two says, it, uh, Emma, I feel your pain. Every time I say professional sports is for losers, people want to get all offended about it. I, I don't I care. Um, Chicken Salad Restaurant says, it's just a bad idea to call potential allies and well-intended people losers. Jesus, really? Like, who cares? Anyway. Is this the yard sign thing? Yes. Um, I... Uh, Silver Ball Stud says the water is life was an important aspect of the pipeline protest mentioned yesterday. The signs, I'm starting to every every I. I had I had no idea people felt so seriously about the signs. I was just joking. I don't think about them at all. I passed them and like, oh, what a, what a sign. That's interesting. Like I, I had no idea people were really that like you know into the signs. Maybe I should get a yard sign. Damn, all these people with yards to put their signs in though should check their privilege. I mean, I feel like, I feel like, I've, been, I feel like I've been convinced. You know, I went from being incredibly anti yard sign to incredibly pro yard sign. And that's not just pandering, folks. Uh, let me tell you, mm. that's sincere. Mm. I'm that, I don't I'm have that, a yard though. So, I'm that, you know, I'm that drill tweet about to turning the racism dial. But for me, it's a yard sign dial where I'm just turning that yard sign now, but I'm not sure what people want. And wherever they cheer, that's where I'll go. You guys I'm want a, yard signs? I'll buy them all. You hate yard signs? I'll torch them. Torch them. That's that's the right wing way, baby. That's how they make their money. You know, you like it, I'll buy it. You don't like it, I'll burn it. I'll buy it to burn it. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Rhea says, Matt's right. Lying shows a complete lack of trust in people, and it only reinforces the distrust of government. There was a mass shortage anyway. The best thing to do is tell the truth and ask people not to purchase masks, or better yet, is a call to action and ask them to donate them to hospitals. Lying is bad. And I don't like know that that wouldn't have you know made people go out and buy masks the people always say look at the toilet paper or whatever right but i do know that i got like an alert on my phone three weeks ago when it was really hot in new york city 
that said, hey, everybody relax on like um, heavy uh, electrical use for the next few hours. And I was annoyed by it when it happened. But the actual effect of it was people stop using electricity a whole lot. So I think maybe having trying at least to have a little um, faith in people. And guess what? If we if that would have compounded the surge of masks, that's not the failure of the people. That's the failure of the government still. No, I mean, I agree with Matt. I think that's an important part to highlight. Like any you know rush to gr- buy out masks if you tell them there's a shortage is a failure of of the government to like, you know, deal with these, I mean, indoctrinate into people a sense of social health and well-being. I mean, I think we just have a like a, we've been talking about the entire episode, but with that selfishness, that individualism, like if you tell people they're gonna run out of masks, that impulse is to run out and buy masks. And so, like trying to deal with that on the back end by lying about masks and never with the whole like, why are people like that question is, you know, it's just not gonna work either. People still ended up, we still ended up running out. Right. Um <clears throat> Didn't they ha- didn't they go around and uh, people who were buying masks to sell them at a ridiculous cost? Weren't these people being like arrested and stuff for doing this? Like, I remember that for um, uh, sanitizer, at least. Yes. Uh, like, that seems like a pretty good deterrent if you want to tell the truth, but also stop people from hoarding stuff in the name of capitalism. It became a whole thing. I mean, you know, I remember when pe- people were being uh, given like incredibly lucrative contracts, like random people's businesses for supplying PPE gear because we were running out because of our supply chain issues uh, that have been, you know, again, a part of the design for the past 20 years in order to manufacture scarcity and other things. You know, people were getting like what, millions of dollars of worth of contracts to supply like n- no PPE gear, faulty PPE gear, like fake in a uh, K uh, in like 95 mask. It was like right. a whole like, you know, grift industry for at least six to nine months. It probably still exists, but there was like an article week after week about a new, per- a new person being like convicted or found out for doing that. It was, you know, it right. was just a free for all. All right, just a few more of these. Um, reasonable citizen says, I'm not as harsh as some. I can forgive kids for dying in a flood or other climate disaster, but once you turn 18, you have to be an adult and accept that it's your fault. <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty funny. Um, LJ3000 says, feels like the aesthetic of professing personal responsibility is what pushes the Overton window right, a superficial form of conservative LARPing that drives politics. Uh the last I am of the day says, isn't Huntington a pretty right wing area of L.A. County? It is. But I just mean, like, we're talking about coasts. You're on the coast. Um, yes, Huntington Beach is super red. I know. Uh, well, that's the thing about the, the way we use elite, which is like, I understand what people are saying when they when they mean elites and don't include that guy. But that guy's literally a, a restaurant owner that's um, forcing masks to, or, or forcing guests to not be masked, or at least like making a show of doing that. Like that's definitely an elite. Any, anybody who can hire and fire somebody um, is an elite, but cult- did you see, did you see that he went on Fox news after the Cuomo hit to talk shit about Cuomo? <laughs> 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 that's really funny to 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 come off that bad in the interview and then go to fox news and, and do a victory <laughs> victory lap <laughs> and the final i am of the day Lo- live life love science and joe and nancy and chuck and kamala says virtue signal that's it's virtue signal sign gal I like. I feel that. like I just. I feel like I just got doxxed. How did you know I had that sign outside my home? <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful. Wait, 9 p.m. tonight. 9 p.m. Eastern time. YouTube.com/slash Matt Binder. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already. Please. YouTube.com/slash Matt Binder, and we'll have a great show. Yes, and check out Left Reckoning, and if... check out my new podcast, uh, Yard Sign. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> promotional something something I haven't, I haven't figured it out yet but yeah it's gonna be all yard signs all the time now all right folks see you tomorrow Matt Sigal street that guy to get to where I want but I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my-
Yeah. 